what is the difference between science and myth, between story and fact? And I haven't settled on a bottom line for that, but I feel like this ties into the esotericism conversation because, well, we're just telling stories. Science is a type of story. Esotericism is a type of story. And they all... And the Neil deGrasse Tyson in me would be like, I can't believe he lives in me somewhere, but he would be like, (laughs) it's about there being testable predictions of your story. Right. So we say like how coherent your story is, right? Like how self-referentially... Uh, or how would you talk about that then? Because I think it's really important. Well, I think that a moral story, the Aesop's fables, I grew up on Aesop's fables. And so for me, that's the easiest example to point to. You have uh, the the fox that wants to get the grapes, but it doesn't get the grapes and it walks away and it's like, ah, the grapes are sour anyways. That's not a, that never happened. As far as I know, right. foxes don't eat grapes. But I mean, frankly, the difference is it's not meant to be taken literally. But, it's actually but, better the more but, the less literal you take it. It's not meant to be taken literally, but it does s- seek to communicate a truth that is in some way predictable. Fair, right? Fair. You're you're making a prediction about the future because you will be in a situation like that at some point. That's the prediction. And the prediction right. is also that this is if you act this way, it will cause you some kind of moral damage. Yes. And again, this is that kind of like I uh, experience right when i was reading you know a genetics paper made no sense at first or this water paper makes no sense at first and then it's kind of this experience then like ends up justifying and it's interesting how these stories kind of try and like seemingly organize these thoughts and ideas for us about uh these abstract subjects and i think that the not taking literal versus taking literal is really really curious to me because my first endeavor into an interest in religious texts was actually a really literal interpretation. This is effectively what ancient aliens is, right? This kind of like new age idea is that when we study these texts, we're going to bring our really scientific, rigorous mind. We're going to try and like decipher these uh, these metaphors that these people used long ago and try and be like, what were they really meaning? And I think that the assumption is that they're trying to describe something of physically a reality that like, they didn't understand. But then the turn is that from like a more esoteric point, the metaphor was very much on purpose because it should not be taken literally, right? And this is kind of the opposite school of like esoteric Christianity is uh, not taking this literally at all. There is a more like mythological version of these ideas uh, that we should be paying attention to. And in fact, there's this concept called uh, profaning the mystery uh, that I think is important. And that's ultimately like, as someone who's an enthusiast about this, what I'm going to do, but there are these central mysteries that these people are trying to pass down and understand. And that when you try and like interpret them in, incorrectly, perhaps using a really literal lens, there's a certain profaning that happens. You, you twist the morals that you get from these stories. Right? And so I think that this is uh, really interesting because I never realized until Shiloh had said when we were hanging out, but a cosmology is kind of an origin story that we have, right? And so we all have these different cosmologies and origin stories and how they play together. And I was kind of trying to go in and like our cosmology is based on, on science where we can check, uh, you know, do this hypothesis testing that Neil deGrasse Tyson might send us. And so then that's what I was trying to do with these other stories. But then how do you do this like checking of ideas with something that's meant to be uh, far less literal, right? And far more esoteric or, or rather ethereal. And uh, that became a really interesting like, uh, place for my mind to spend because I, how was my science useful there, <laughs> right? Uh, I know it seems really hard to draw something concrete. And I think this gets at the, what you're getting at, it's like, what is the, this question, what is the purpose of, of science, of, you know, of Aesop's fables, where are they trying to tell us where is information? And uh, the realization is that our current science Typical cosmology is kind of like devoid of meaning, right? It's like a seemingly kind of like a random happenstance that's interesting. You can find beauty in this randomness. You can find beauty that there were, was just some random events billions of years ago, and then voila, we were like born. Uh, that beauty is not lost on me, but it doesn't give much direction, right? If you inherit this as your origin story, what does it tell you to do in the future? It's also uh, a lot of hopelessness, like, right? The, the heat death of the universe or black holes swallows the galaxy or... Or new physics, like being fate, right? 
uh, like, I think that we've gone through this, like, really series of evolution of thought of that's exactly it, right? Like, if we play this clock forward based on our observations now, then we have this fate that's really, like, the, we're just going to uh, slowly simmer off into oblivion over several trillion years with heat Dest- death, right? Prescribed uh, destiny, almost. Exactly. Uh, and, you know... I think it's kind of interesting, like, did this prescription of destiny exist before Newton, right? Like, you come up with these ideas, you really rigorize uh, calculus and physics, and now you can suddenly, like, predict with incredible accuracy events around you in the world, right? And I'm not sure if we had this before. Uh, and so now we get obsessed with this predicting this, like, clockwork of the universe. And we get so good at doing this, and we get so good at measuring our predictions that we eventually get to, you know, the dawn of quantum, where now we're measuring so well that our measurements no longer make sense. And suddenly this whole clockwork notion of God's plan of the universe and your fate gets, like, thrown into question in, in our human thinking, where now things seem truly random. Uh, that is what quantum physics kind of tells us. Or, like, not truly random, uh, because you can still, like, deviate from this randomness. And I think that this 2022 Nobel Prize in physics is really... You know, this is a, that's a story that's like 60 years in the making of just looking. And I, I don't know too much about this. And if you guys feel like anything about this, I think it's curious. But uh, how and like what information is and how it's transmitted, right, is far different than what Newtonian physics expected. So once again, we're now at this like change in cosmic thought of humanity that really is opening the door to not having this like clockwork universe. Or maybe it looks different than what the Newtonian physics gave us. Uh, and I think that we're really in this era where we got so good at measuring that we measured to like absurdity, right? Our ruler got so small, uh, that we no longer make sense of what we're measuring. Uh, and this is like, you can't predict where a particle will go once you know its location, like kind of particle wave duality, uh, according to our cosmology. And I think that that's where we sit right now in this like midst of changing of human thought, uh, through these different like scientific paradigms, right? Like, uh, and yeah, that's kind of where I got stuck uh, for a long time. And it was in this like search for meaning, right? That uh, I think that a lot of people start to, to dive deep. And for me, it was looking into these different podcast theories of everything, trying to figure out what people are thinking on this. And um, I think that this is also like where the... Uh, Actually, I'm a little bit stuck right now on this one. I uh, mean, you guys can help me out. Uh, Wait, wrap, wrap it onto uh, wrap it onto a point that can be not not, not to, that yeah. sounds mean. Wrap it to something no, no. that that like uh, that has a, a catch on it because that was a lot of ideas. Right. Um, my favorite place I'd like to like get to with that, or there's two on this. Um, well, the question, the, I mean, there's so many things there. The, the fact that we've come down to the limits of our measurements and then that we don't sort of recognize that that's what's happening is really interesting. So I think it is interesting what you're saying that scientists themselves, physicalists, scientists, physicists, have come to the point where they're faced with things that don't make sense and they're open to telling all sorts of mystical stories about what's happening down there for the first time in several hundred years where, where that became possible again because we're in the dark with those things. And, and the same can be said about deep cosmology and astrophysics. You can't really see that well, what's happening super far away or, or in the distant past. The same thing happens with archaeology and so forth. You reach these points where you're at the limits of your observation. Now, you might be able to do experiments and then they're indirect assays. So you have to, again, you get to kind of have this Ouija board where you can fill in the blanks a bit. But even science in the Western world itself has come up against this nebulous region where myth-making can occur. The question is, is the modern scientific myth-making meaningful? And I, I would argue that it's not. And this is something yeah. that I think is really important because at some point, when you get far enough down to a theory, you get to choose how you explain the thing that you're seeing. And I'm not, and, and you get to choose on the basis of your most deeply held quiet beliefs that drive you on a day to day level. Right. 
And so if you look at the distinction between, you know, Bohr and Einstein, who famously were on opposite sides of the interpretation of quantum physics, Einstein's God doesn't play dice, Bohr's Copenhagen interpretation. This is the epitome of these two metaphysical systems that come into conflict with one another. And at the time, Einstein is, is getting old. He's no longer the, the prince of the physics world. He's now this befuddled king that's paraded out like uh, a, a figurehead at these conferences and at these parties, and they carry him on the palanquin as, as, as something to worship, but they're not necessarily listening to what he's saying because he's sitting on the palanquin and he's, he's saying, that, no, 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 this, what you're saying isn't right. It's not possible. There are reasons that you can turn away from this probabilistic, irrational mess. And Bohr, on the other hand, is very powerful at the time. And he's the one who's insisting that the probabilistic interpretation is the necessary one. And this is a metaphysical conflict because both interpretations are valid. And it is the zeitgeist of the times that chooses which one becomes more popular. Right. And that's so powerful, right? Like, uh, I think this is what is very important. And uh, in previous podcasts where you guys were on the road, you had talked about this of like, uh, we enter in as scientists with a set of ideas and this biases us. We enter in with the cosmology. And so kind of describing that Bohr and Einstein have completely different cosmologies looking at the same data, right? One where there's a world of randomness and one where there's a world of God not playing dice, which seems to implicate a, a strict order. Uh, and I think it, the data supports both. And I really like this idea of quantum physics is like a pile of observations with no real like agree upon theory, right? And I think that you guys have come across this now. And I think this is also after trying to follow different theories of everything for a long time, um, the question kind of stopped becoming relevant to me because I didn't realize like what I would do with that, right? It, it becomes one of those things where the heat death of the universe is in like several billion years. I, 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 to understand that completely now at this point in my life seems to like be a little bit delusional, right? If that's the case, like what should I be doing now? 